Greetings, and uh, thank you all for coming. I hope this will be an interesting presentation for you all. This is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I, I worked in Congress for uh, a member who represented the Johnson Space Center. Um, I've been all around the world. I've been to some very uh, ghastly countries, liberty-wise, and uh, as well as many that are shining examples. Um, it's easy to take our freedom for granted here and to find, forget the rest of the world, uh, you know, that they don't live in as much liberty. So many countries, China, uh, and North Korea, all of them. Um, but our Constitution protects our liberty, just as similar documents do in other countries. You have freedom of speech. You have uh, freedom of religion, legal rights. You can elect your leaders and so many other basic freedoms. A free Mars colony would share these rights. A non-free col colony would have few, if any, uh, human rights. Last year, I presented a broad overview of the principles of liberty. Uh, and you, you can see it on YouTube, sort of the, the principles of, of freedom and, and uh, how we would apply in space. So let's look at the next 50 years or so as Mars colonies are born, grow, and evolve. Uh, and if we don't fully understand the principles of liberty, then this is uh, founding the United Nations there. Human rights are everybody's rights. They're not just for Americans or, you know, people from Europe. They're for people in China. They're for people in uh, every, everywhere around the world that doesn't enjoy them uh, today. Uh, so one day we will be here and we want to make sure that it's a happy future. Um, and some of you might actually go to Mars. Uh, raise your hand if you want to go to Mars. <laughs> All right, I love it. Uh, I want to make sure you live in freedom. First off, what is liberty? In a word, ownership. Who owns you? Who owns you know, yourself? The government? Somewhere in between? You can imagine a lot of governments around the world on a spectrum of you own yourself to the government owns you totally. North Korea, a um, lot, of, lot of ways, China, uh, uh, and so forth. They don't have freedom. If you say the wrong word, you get a bullet. If you, uh, or you get sent to a gulag, a Lao guy, concentration camp. And that is the human condition. Unfortunately, that will follow us to the moon, to Mars, and to other planets. Uh, and so, Defend, knowing our rights, defending them, is going to be essential as, as we reach for the stars. Anyone forming a colony would be very selective at first. You have a small colony, maybe dozens or a few hundred. You're going to have doctors, engineers, scientists, geologists, construction workers, uh, and other nutritionists, other people who are essential to running that. You're not going to have, you know, you, you may have tourists and so forth and other people who are paying to be there as well, retirees perhaps, things like that. Um, but you'll probably be required to work your profession in order to stay there. And you'll probably sign some sort of contract to that effect. So a, uh, a contract would probably specify your rights, your freedoms, your responsibilities to the colony. Unlike Earth, everybody's going to be like under one dome or something, and if somebody, the guy who's supposed to repair the seals on the airlock doesn't do his job, then everyone can die. So, so there will be some sort of contract. You'll also have to figure out how disputes are handled, how justice is handled. Uh, you know, even the most innocent people can <coughs> run into disputes, commercial disputes. I did this. I think I'm owed that. 
uh, my product was defective and and somebody uh, you know got injured as a result things like that so and there'll be background checks to assure compatibility with the purpose of, of the colony and other colonists so if you want to have a colony with a particular philosophical purpose and there is somebody in there that says well you know I want to be the Emperor of Mars well you might want to screen those people out before you <laughs> take <them on. laughs> with you um, so and in the small confines of an early colony you're going to find you know people's emotional stability challenged in great ways if you've seen the uh, the uh, National Geographic Mars series. It gives you a little taste of that, what happens under stress uh, with, uh, with people. Now, uh, contracts aren't nothing, are nothing new to sort of a structure of government. In fact, in the early, early uh, America, Jamestown, Plymouth, and so forth, they were basically organized by a contract. And both of those had problems with some of their contracts that almost destroyed the colonies, uh, uh, but they were able to rectify it. Something else to keep in mind is justice. Like I said, there will be people that need to be thrown in jail. There's actually going to be one day a Mars jail, and it's going to have somebody in it, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but if you don't have the jail, or at least prepared what to do if somebody goes crazy and, like in the National Geographic Mars series, wants to blow the airlock and kill lots of people, uh, then you're going to be unprepared. Uh, so these are not black swans, the unknown unknowns. These are the known knowns, what you need to survive when you're in close contact with a lot of people. And you can't just kick them out. What it, you know, you can't exile them. It's sort of like, here's a, a day's rations and, and air bottles, go. Uh, that, that would be a death sentence. So you you got to come up with sort of new ways of handling that sort of thing. You know, free nations and tyrannies differ greatly in justice. As I said, justice is delivered uh, with a bullet or a concentration camp in many countries. But free nations have transparent legal systems that offer the presumption of innocence and have the necessary laws to ensure a safe and free society. Again, your rights are protected. There is, a, you know, your right to speak out and say, I believe this, I don't believe that, uh, and so forth. And, um, and it's fair, transparent, and equitable in our system. There's always faults, but we're generally self-correcting. Not so in many other countries where um, this is not the case. Now here's something interesting, and this is actually a, a very important part of how you maintain liberty in space. Trade. Trade creates an economy, which is an essential element of liberty. For any colony to survive, just as with any family, uh, company, city, or nation, you need to trade, create products and services to trade with others. Um, and for their needs. An independent Mars colony will be very heavily dependent for perhaps decades to come on funding from Earth to supply the, uh, the, the basics. It'll be a long time before people are able to manufacture a lot of things you need. Um, and so let's break it down a little bit. Let's look at some of the things Mars colonists need. Food that can't be grown indigenously. Uh, you know, personally, I'll be at the starship elbowing aside everyone else when the next one comes in with some roast beef. Um, medicines and medical equipment. Anything and everything high tech. <coughs> Spacesuits, space <coughs> vehicles, robots, electronics, life support, all these things will be uh, very difficult to manufacture until you've got a really large colony. Uh, you know, a wafer fab for making uh, integrated circuits. Those are huge, multi-billion dollar things. And, uh, and so 
you're going to be dependent on Earth a lot for many things like that. Manufactured items that can't be uh, 3D printed. Feedstocks for your 3D printers. If you can't synthesize it on Mars, then you're going to have starships coming in laden down with a cargo of nothing but feedstocks for your 3D printers. Uh, and you'll be lining up for the ones you need for what you're making. Access to communications, satellites, and Earth Internet. It's not going to be free to have some commsats in Mars orbit that are talking to commsats in Earth orbit that are then linked into uh, the Internet. Um, and then Earth-based technical support. Think, Houston, we have a problem. Every NASA mission has got people on the ground uh, that engineers, and they've got duplicate copies of whatever it is. So if on ISS they say, uh, you know, the um, yesterday's coffee is today's coffee toilet um, isn't working, well, there's somebody that can look at that and duplicate the problem and come up with a solution. You may not be able to where you are on Mars, but back home you'll need that tech support guy uh, or gal who can uh, who can bail you out uh, when your um, space toilet or whatever it is breaks down. And these needs will create a great trade imbalance, barring very generous philanthropists. But the problem with philanthropists is what if they die or run out of money? And your survival depends on maybe a hundred million or a billion dollars in uh, supplies every launch window. <coughs> Strator launch, it may die because Paul Allen uh, passed away. He was, it was his thing and is kind of limping along now. Uh, the eventual heirs to Elon Musk, will they, will they inherit the, those dreams? Maybe not. Second generation, third generation foundations often go astray from their original noble purposes. Um, or what if they simply lose their fortunes through market forces? Suddenly Amazon is no longer a thing and everyone's on to something else and Amazon is a uh, penny stock and Bezos <laughs> can't afford to keep sending you stuff or, um, or you know, everyone's on to drones and they're not buying Teslas and Elon's kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, or they, they, you know, so all of these things sound bleak. Look at this. What can Mars trade for the essentials? Well, there's actually a whole lot. Tourism, of course. You got unique retirement uh, opportunities, uh, or just people who want to live on Earth, on, on Mars, and they've got the resources to live there and not be there doing something like repairing the airlocks or, you know, running the, the computer system. They just want to live there, and you know, so maybe, maybe they're paying ten million bucks a year or something for that privilege. That's a good thing. Uh, Mars rocks, made on Mars products. Those are going to be pretty hot. One project I did years ago, when the Berlin Wall opened in 1989, me and three friends, we flew over there, and I brought back a thousand pounds of the Berlin Wall. And I sold it. I sold it in little pieces, I sold it in huge pieces, and so forth. Uh, people will buy Mars rocks. They'll buy, they'll buy anything made on Mars. It's going to have that little logo on it, and, uh, and it's going to be a hot, hot item. Uh, and you know, there, there may be minerals unavailable or very scarce on Earth. Uh, on the moon, think helium-3. China has uh, talked a lot about uh, importing that for fusion. Uh, and uh, <coughs> there, there, there will probably be some things, minerals, you know, natural resources that may be very scarce on Earth. Uh, I, I don't know. You, if you're extracting it, you've got your mining equipment and so forth, it's going to be a lot more costly to mine on Mars and then ship back and so forth. So that market may not be too great. Remote work for Earth-based companies. Uh, maybe some of you work day a week or permanently for somebody else and you're just at your computer um, and in, in your uh, office or your living room 
or your patio and you're working away for them. And there'll probably be a lot of that. It's not that they would necessarily pay more for you living on Mars unless they wanted your perspective on Mars, but you might be able to just be, say, a scientist or whatever and plunking away and it'll be as tra transparent except for the communications lab as, uh, as here. Uh, then uh, intellectual property. Imagine all of those uh, those things that they will. There'll be a lot of inventions created on Mars out of necessity or just randomly and accidentally and through entrepreneurs. Uh, and some of those will be very valuable on uh, on Earth. Um, then uh, things like music, literature, poetry, photography, and artwork. That's something that will have a big consumer market here, uh, you know, and, and monetize your video stream. So you get up one morning and you say, that pale blue dot is just so lovely. I love watching that. And then looking down at the red earth. Somebody's going to uh, pay for that. Somebody's going to buy your photographs, your poetry. Um, refueling and supply services. That's that's going to be a, a market, and so if you run a company or your colony provides that service, you're getting Earth dollars to re refuel that spacecraft and put uh, Mars-grown uh, vegetables on it for the return trip. And entertainment. Oops, out of sequence. <laughs> And I lost the uh, slide there somewhere. But uh, the, um, there will be sports on the moon and on Mars and in space. And some of those will be really out of this world. Um, in, in the low gravity, you can just kind of imagine what, what's possible. You know, I don't know, 40 foot high uh, basketball hoop. Uh, strap on uh, wings and fly around uh, with a little teeny uh, jetpack or something like that. But that's going to really be a huge thing. The broadcast rights, uh, as well as the performance rights, you, you can charge for that. So if you are fly, flying around uh, with wings and while playing basketball or tennis or something, then you'll be paid rather handsomely. Online universities, you can teach low gravity physiology to people on Earth who, who want, need to learn it, uh, and so forth. So we're at the, um, oh, and, and trading between colonies will become a thing too. You know, if you are near a deposit of something that somebody else needs, then you can mine that and sell it to the manufacturing col colony, let's say. And the Russians might exchange the potatoes you grow for vodka, <laughs> you know, essentials. So at any rate, we're here at Mars Society because we want to be part of reaching Mars and perhaps live on Mars one day. And so your task in, in planning a colony must go beyond the technological. You must create products and services Earth needs and wants in at least equal value to your import needs. And let me find out what happened with this uh, thing here to put my uh, slide in the wrong place. Um, I, I, I got a little too much of uh, the board there. At, at any rate, um, there's a, a, go to that adjusted picture of it or something. This, this is a beautiful website that talks about how the economies of a thousand person um, colony. And and so they, they do have some excellent descriptions and flows. The author, of, I'm the author. What's that? I'm the author of this work. The author. What's that? It's his website. You are? Yeah. Oh, what a delight. We'll have to talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so I'm just giving a couple of, a few of their slides there, you know, consumables, the mat, the, 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 the weight and so forth, costs and so forth. It's really impressive. So thank you. Um, now, uh, but what does this have to do with liberty? 
Um, in a nutshell, if you can't pay for your life essentials, you either die, return to Earth, or cut a deal with the devil. China or future totalitarians. China would love to assimilate your colony into their board. That's why I had that slide. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then dictate their terms for your survival and plunder their technology. This is what they do on Earth. South China Sea, Hong Kong, things like that. I've toured both Chinese and American-owned factories in China. As you would expect, the Chinese-owned factories are effectively controlled by the Communist Party. They're in a total regimentation. Party spies report any wrong thinking, things like that, child labor, toxic pollution, the whole bit. But at the Shanghai Buick factory, I saw the same thing. There's the same Communist posters hanging on the wall. They have the same regimentation. They have the same spies, party spies, that'll report you if you say or do the wrong thing. So if we expect China to respect human rights on Mars or respect other colonies, and they're setting a poor example with their own people every day in Hong Kong, as we're seeing today, and by trying to seize the international waters and sovereign territories of other nations in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and eventually the Yellow Sea. Um, that's how a Chinese colony would be run on Mars. They, they, they won't have two rules, just like they're, they're trying to extinguish the freedom that exists in Hong Kong. Um, so if you take Chinese money or you joint venture with them, whether altruistically, believing you know, we're all people and so forth, or uh, out of desperation to survive because you're not selling enough whatever uh, to bring in the, uh, to pay for the next shipment of supplies, then you become the Borg. The NBA, they took Chinese money, they're now dependent on it, and so they're ordering their players, you must stand for the Chinese flag, and if you say anything critical of them, you're off the game. Um, you know, so there, there goes free speech in America, in an American team at the orders of Beijing. Colonies, therefore, must be organized from the start with a constitution that respects and allows for liberty, that guarantees liberty, that allows free speech, elections, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and the press, and all the other fundamental human rights. That's how you stay free and independent. And we must insist that our rights here are protected there, too. That's our challenge. If we're unprepared, then it all goes, uh, you know, the, the worst instincts of humanity take over. One route for early colonies to have a guarantee of freedom would be to associate themselves under the laws and constitutions of free nations on Earth. Newt Gingrich proposed a space colony could petition to be admitted as a, as a U.S. state, and probably some will. Some may decide, well, I want to, we want ours to be associated with uh, the EU or Australia or wherever. Um, and there, you know, I don't think there will be ever, you know, there, there may not ever be a real Mars government any more than there's a U.S. government. You'll have national bases. U.S., China, you know, India, the, the, the whole gamut. You'll have people that are there for particular philosophies and purposes, but it, it may take a very long time uh, for a unified government that can represent all these different philosophies. Um, to summarize, creating or maintaining a free colony is not automatic or guaranteed. Take the wrong money and you're on the path to tyranny. Fail to create an export market and you'll go bankrupt and face life, life or death choices. Um, fail to provide for fair justice and conflict resolution and you'll have an ungovernable society. Fail to provide for defense for your colony and you may lose it to inevitable aggressors. But create a culture of liberty and educate your colonists to cherish and protect that liberty. And then you'll be building a generation willing to defend their freedoms themselves. You know, if it's like, you must defend freedom or something, you know, I may not do it. But if everybody believes, just like you and I, it's like somebody says something, 
and you may not like it, but you'll say at least, oh, he's got a right to say it, First Amendment. Um, so at any rate, you may be on Mars one day in your life, and you have a right to demand the same freedom you have on Earth. Uh, and so I'm happy to discuss this more over the course of the, of the uh, conference. I've got two talks tomorrow, one on Artemis, why 2024 is essential, and then how to lobby Congress uh, for uh, greater support for the space program. I hope you'll come to those. Uh, but happy to take a few questions if we've got a few minutes. There. Um, I think one of the first, uh, first uh, exports is going to be if I'm a geology professor here on Earth, and instead of rehashing all the same old stuff about continental drift everyone else has been doing, and, and rewriting papers, I can go out there to a totally new world and, and, and discover totally new, write put papers about totally new geology and get funding from the NSF or the, mm -hmm. or the Outer Space Space Foundation or something like that. Um, that's number one. I think that's going to be the foundation of, of first base camps on Mars. And number two is going to be if they actually find some biology over there, likewise biologists are going to go crazy um, because that's going to be something that they can't do over here. Absolutely. So much research using things you can't do uh, do here. Who is next? Blue, blue shirt. Yeah, then you, then you. So my question for us, as soon as we talk about liberty and uh, rights, it should be eventually a point of law enforcement. Right? You mentioned about the prism, but the question is, who will enforce that? Do we have policemen? Then we do allow a weapon on Mars, rather than knife. Something else, right? Well, in weapons can always be created and invented. They they make zip guns. They they, they make shanks and prisons and things like that. But see, you you can't say it'll, there won't be any weapons. Uh, and you know, I'm I'm sure there, there will be smugglers bringing in uh, things. But be, there's there's for you to make. But policemen. Well, if you've got a small colony, it's probably going to be governed under some sort of contract, uh, and there will be some sort of security service. Call it what you will. As you get larger and there's sort of an actual formal government and all the colonists vote for this guy or gal to be the leader and, and so forth, that then you would get those sort of actual governmental uh, positions like, you know, public works, police and, and other things like that. Um, How soon you'll get the first gun? Once you have 100 people or 1,000 people? The first Gun. Gun. Uh, the the, the yeah. moment somebody makes one, it, it's very easy. When you get you can 3D print, print, print a gun. 3D printer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, under the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, you know, we can't claim any heavenly bodies uh, as national territory. It also bans nuclear weapons in outer space. That's one reason that sure. people don't want to mess yeah, with this yeah. treaty because it's very valuable. However, uh, would it? Would that create complications for trying to extend legal authority from, like, the United States to the Martian surface? Yeah, excellent point. The, the uh, Congress actually passed a bill, I want to say about four or five years ago, uh, Linear, trying to clarify a bit. You know, certainly, I think even under the Outer Space Treaty, if you plant a colony right here, uh, let's say a shack near Shackleton Crater on, on the moon or a nice water area on, uh, on Mars, then, then there is at least some you know, legal understandings and you've got a right to where you are and some limited amount around it uh, and, and so forth. And you can call that yours and you can mine minerals wherever you find them and you ship them back to, uh, to Earth and use them. Uh, back to the room. Yeah, I'm just curious if, if, if a private company is, is the seat of a colony, say it's SpaceX, mm -hmm. and they put together their own autonomous uh, contract for all their employees who work there, and eventually those employees may need to go back to Earth under contract where they may decide to stay. If mm -hmm. they decide to stay and they leave the company, what is there anything in international law right now that treats them? Are, are they Americans or are they say they're Australians working for SpaceX and they decide to leave the company? They're on Mars. <laughs> what is is this going to default to a UN 
citizenship or I, I think a lot of your your th that is is sort of uncharted territory you know again I said some colonies colonies may decide to associate themselves with the laws of, of a particular country uh, and in which case th then that may be the foundation of how you do it if you have a, a SpaceX colony and somebody uh, says uh, I'm just not going to work anymore and so forth. And if there's no place to send them, what do you do? I mean, that's kind of a contract thing. Certainly, they'd be on the next Starship uh, home. Uh, but they uh, – um, th thank you all. I do, do appreciate it. Um, so uh, – but what do you do with them in the meantime if they're just being troublemakers? I don't know. Things that, you know, there, there are so many things we will discover at the time. So, if nothing else, what's the Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese saying? May you live in interesting times. So, we'll find out. Um, are you next? Well, anyway, thank you all very much.